In our next session, which I'm about to introduce and we're getting everyone together backstage for, I want to invite if there's anyone with disabilities or if anyone would like to come up forward for this next session. We're going to be talking about accessibility in space. And we have some fantastic panelists um, just about ready to come out. So uh, it is our goal to take questions, but this is going to be very thorough and it's quite a large panel. So we're looking forward to filling it and filling the time. So as I get prepared to uh, introduce them, I want to also let everyone know that we have a fantastic lunch event that's coming up soon with our speaker, Dr. Matt Schindel. And um, as you know, he's our author featured this year for The Love of Mars. And if any of you were here last year, you remember that when it comes to the lunch session with our authors, it's quite an event and it's usually a lot of fun. How many of you were here last year when we had um, uh, Mark share the big book of Mars. Were you here? Wasn't that phenomenal? That was fantastic. And if any of you want to have some more fun with Mark, I plan on having him on the Casual Space podcast in just about two weeks. We talk all about his book, and we continue the conversation, and you know, authors are always writing, so he's got more in the works coming, and I can't wait to hear from Matt today as well. So remember, if you have questions, there's microphones on each side. If you have disabilities, or if you'd like to come down, now would be a perfect time. We're, going, we're just about ready to start the panel discussion here on accessibility in space. So give us one more minute and uh, we'll get ready to start. Thanks. All right, we're just about ready to get started as we reset the stage. So let me once again give you this opportunity as you're taking your breaks. I want to introduce you to some opportunities on social media. I hope that you are hashtagging humans to Mars and of course tagging Explore Mars. We have events like this all throughout the year. How many of you join us for our workshops? and some of the online events. If you haven't, I highly recommend going to the website where we have more conversations like this, more guests, phenomenal guests that help us and educate us and inspire us. And it's the perfect place for us to have conversations that go on, that people can ask questions. We can really engage and have a more casual conversation. So make sure you're getting onto the website, make sure you're registering and joining us because oftentimes we know that not everyone can be here and not everyone can attend, but we plan out those workshops so that we can have those extended conversations. And we kind of have a little more fun. They're usually in the evening, um, not so much in a formal sense, and everyone kind of gets to get in their questions and have a great conversation. So make sure you're joining us and registering. All right, thank you. It is now time to introduce the panel. It's fantastic. As we get ready to talk about accessibility in space, please give a warm welcome to our moderator today, Dr. Sheena Gifford. Thank you. And thank you, thank you. And Eric Igram of Scout Aerospace. All right, Scout Space Inc. But Scout Space Inc., yes. my apologies. Close enough. Before we start, could you actually tell me quickly about Scout Space Inc.? I've known you for years now, but I don't know much about what you do. I really wanna know more. Yeah, so uh, at Scout, we are working on solving the information gap that exists in space by developing um, systems for collecting information about objects in space for either space domain awareness or um, space traffic management use cases and things like that. That is so awesome. All right, I want to talk about that more, but I also want to talk about accessibility in space because all of our amazing friends here are joining us from all over the world. Please help us welcome our other panelists on accessibility in space today, Mr. Dwayne Fernandez. Hi, Dwayne. Hello. What time is it where you are, Dwayne? Uh, very, very early. It's um, 1.53 a.m. In Sydney, Australia. <laughs> Dwayne is a very good man. Thank you for joining us today, Dwayne. I'm okay. Sheila, hello. And you are in Italy right now, am I correct? Yes, yes, that's right. I am in Italy, my other home. Thank you so much for joining us. And am I, do I remember that? Recording that, uh, in progress. That uh, to say your name correctly in ASL, is it this? Do I have it correctly? Must I use my right hand? This? So it's like this okay. on your chin, Sheila. This is an S on your chin. Thank yep, you. Yep, good job. 
Thank you, Sheila. John, John, thank you for joining us today. Where are you, John? I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. All right. Not quite Sydney or Italy, but still. <laughs> thank you for joining us today, John. And Lucas, our, our very own Space Jesus, will tell you more about that later. Thank you for joining us, Lucas. Hey, nice to meet you all. All right. These fine human beings, the ones sitting next to me, the ones on the screen, are all Astro Access ambassadors. So before we get down to it, could Eric, could you talk to us about what an Astro Access ambassador is? Sure, and I think uh, to introduce that, we should introduce Astro Access specifically, which is an organization looking to make space flight accessible for everyone so that um, if anyone does get the chance to go to orbit or suborbit, um, things like uh, impairments from physical infrastructure or anything like that aren't impeding your ability to participate. Um, we are not solving the cost issue specifically, but making sure that the only barrier to entry is, is essentially that. Um, and ambassadors are uh, those chosen with um, certain kinds of disabilities who uh, are putting these things to the test um, making sure that we are solving the right problems, putting the right life experiences towards those solutions, and um, really working to make this uh, idea um, that was thought up, I think, like two and a half years ago into a reality and making sure that it's being pushed forward in all facets of um, space industries development. And before I go any further, I want to say this is a, a panel about accessibility and inclusion. If anyone here in this audience considers themselves to have an adaptation or disability of any kind, I'd like to invite you to join us down here in front. Please, this is your panel, and we are here for you, and we especially want you to be with us, be near us, and ask us questions at the end. So please, again, before we go any further, one thing I would like to ask people on this panel is, how do you feel about the word Disability, should we use that word today or should we use a different word? All right, I, I can, can try to take, yeah, go yeah. ahead. You all go first. I'm not too picky about terms. Uh, maybe because to my heart, I'm an engineer. I think the only thing we need to agree sometimes is like, uh, let's agree to a word and then let's try to find solutions. So I personally am not, of course, talking uh, for everyone, but I'm totally okay with this term. Uh, I don't think we need to be ashamed or anything like that. Uh, it's the opposite. I think we should just be proud of it. And my friend, before we go on, please tell everybody what you do with engineering, Lucas. Uh, I work as a senior software engineer at Google. Uh, I'm a tech lead for a team and we are developing um, accessibility solutions in the operating system space. And uh, outside of work, uh, one of my main areas of interest is trying to make uh, mathematics and science accessible, uh, mainly for blind people, so that they can access this kind of material and study and uh, be involved in the uh, engineering, science, uh, technology, and this kind of thing. Um, so that's why, and that's how I actually got involved with Astro Access. Fantastic. Next, Sheila, could you tell us what you do and how you feel about the term disability? Sure. So really, <clears throat> my position is interesting. <laughs> so I am deaf. So I'm involved in, in deaf culture in the deaf community. And in the deaf community, we don't really consider ourselves as disabled because, you know, we have a linguistic and cultural piece to our community. So we don't consider ourselves as having a disability. But we live in a hearing world, and that means that we do need accommodations. And the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, that law specifically protects those accommodations that we need and allows us to continue having access as we move through the world. So we have that linguistic and cultural piece where we don't view ourselves as disabled, but we have to view ourselves as disabled in order to profit, um, you know, benefit from the ADA and that law. Thank you for that. I just want to point out too, and I'm a doctor for the disabled, I myself do not have an adaptation or a disability, but I'm a doctor on earth for people with different kinds of abilities and disabilities, and I've gone up with the ambassadors. And once you eliminate gravity, disabilities often are eliminated as well. 
they vanish. And if we engineer this world correctly, they would also vanish. I just want to put that out there. People, people are disabled or have functions that limit their ability to interact with the world because of the way we've built the world, not because of the way they are. And moving on, John, please tell us what you do and how you feel about the world disability. That, that's a, your comments are a perfect segue. Um, I'm John Kemp. I'm president and CEO of Lakeshore Foundation in Birmingham, Alabama, um, a world-renowned place where Team USA Wheelchair Rugby is number one. We're a health, wellness, fitness, nutrition, advocacy, and research organization that uh, houses high-performance athletes. And we'll be developing a sports science institute here in the next couple of months and opening it up. Um, the, the word disability is an evolving one, uh, and people get hung up on whether you say person with a disability or disabled person, and they start forgetting the fact that we're really just talking about people. And so as we evolve our language, I think the most important thing is, is really what Lucas was talking about and what you were talking about, Shana, which is showing fundamental respect and inclusion of all people and everyone having an equal and fair opportunity. Um, barriers are in, inadvertently placed in front of us and before us, and most of the time it's not us who has the problem, it's the environment that causes so much of the problem, it's the technology that causes the lack of access, and when all things are equal, we you, you get the benefit of another 20% of the world's population, at least, in, in full participation. And for those of you who like numbers, between 10 and 20% of the world's population has an adaptation or is a person with a disability. So they're just people, they're us. And all of us at one point or the other, doctor speaking, are going to be somewhere off the normal spectrum. And I mean normal configuration, normal functioning. It's just a matter of time. So that's one of the reasons we should engineer the world for universal accessibility so that it can be used by everyone, universal accessibility for universal utilization. How do you feel about that, Eric? Well, I know one of the things we joke about like, is if you live long enough, you will definitely join the disabled population. It's the only minority group you can join at any time. So um, it's, it's best to be invested in these solutions early because the fact that, um, for, oh, so I'll, I'll jump in and say like, I'm very word agnostic and usually not very politically correct. So I don't care as long as we're included in the conversation. Um, and uh, as what John was saying, like our disabilities are only evident because of the environment we've built around us that show that um, if, you know, 5,000 years ago when we started building large structures, if we decided that ramps were the way to go and not stairs, um, a lot of the conversations we'd be talking about wouldn't be existent, right? And so it's the environment we've crafted around us that have um, forced this conversation in these situations. And um, that's what we're trying to prevent for humanity going beyond Earth. So we're at the beginning of this precipice where we're designing something that isn't fully designed yet so we can bake in these experiences. But I don't want to exclude Dwayne from the conversation. I know he's very vocal. About because Dwayne has a lot to me? say. No, not at <laughs> say all, it, right? Dwayne. So, uh, so with regards to where I sit in the area of disability and what it means is that I used to host a show around disability inclusion in space on another app. And in that area, what I found is that your identity and how much you identify with your disability has got to do with your society's expectations around that and the stigmas that go with it. And so where I am in Australia, we're pulled in two major directions between the UK and the US, which is person first language versus disability first language, which is the UK versus the US. And um, as someone who's a double baloney amputee, um, yeah, missing a few fingers and apparently now recently diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I, I have a, like, I'm in this community, but my identity changed after that flight um, in December because most of my identity came with the fact that as a person with a disability, it was based upon gravity. And without gravity, am I a person with a disability? I found myself to be super enabled. And so 
I had to reassess myself. Who is Dwayne Fernandez in a world where gravity doesn't exist? And how do I get myself back there? And this is why we're here, right? To talk about how you're building a future that is going to be better than what we built here on Earth. And because everything is going through that nice metal tube, we have to make it as accessible as possible as we all go through that metal tube. And it'll make both sides of it beautiful for all. Back to you. Well, let's talk about that metal tube. All right. And let's talk about making that metal tube universally accessible and usable because we want everyone who wants to go to space to go. So first of all, accessibility in space. Why is it important and why now? What do you think, Eric? All right. I'll, I'll dive in here. Um, it's kind of what I mentioned before. It's important because um, eventually the entirety of hu a human's life will occur off Earth. And um, so the entirety of the human condition will follow that, um, be it naturally uh, existing disabilities uh, through birth, like myself, through acquired disabilities via amputation, or um, you know someone falls off their bunk bed at, I guess, one third Earth's gravity or something, um, and and something happens, uh, there will need to be things in place to accept these changes in condition. So um, the why is uh, humans and human existence and the inevitability of all of that. Um, the why now, I think, is another important piece. It's because, um, as I mentioned before, we're at the very beginning of this. If you look at the entirety of humanity's existence, like the part that includes human spaceflight is a blip. And so we're early enough in this where we can design it how we actually want to design it. It is very engineer uh, heavy now, and it's very um, designed out of mechanical necessity and keeping the squishy people intact. And then um, beyond that, not much else. And so, um, you know, what we're working for and with the uh, microgravity flights we do on the zero G parabolic um, aircraft is test out solutions that are beneficial for, for people with physical disabilities, for people with visual impairments, for people with hearing impairments, um, and the things that we will need to not just exist in these microgravity or lesser gravity environments, but uh, to thrive and be able to contribute just as much, if not more so, than uh, a quote-unquote able-bodied um, participant. Thank you. And the pictures you might be seeing on the screen, those are of the two crews. That picture up right now is the crew from December in Houston. And uh, all of the ambassadors here, this was Eric's second flight. The ambassadors here with us today, Sheila, John, Dwayne, and Lucas, were on this second flight where we did a series of parabolic flights and we had lunar, Martian, and microgravity, but mostly microgravity on the flight. Sheila, why is accessibility in space important and why should we be talking about it now? Well, really, ever since I was a kid, I had a dream of becoming an astronaut. But as an American, I know that NASA, there are a lot of barriers for people who, who want to become an astronaut. So I just moved on with my life because I thought it wouldn't actually be an option for me. But I still continued my interest in space. I went to MIT for undergraduate studies and I majored in earth sciences. And then I went to work for NASA in the JPL. And also I did a short time in the FAA under the Department of Transportation. And then, well, since then, I've had a lot of amazing opportunities that I've been able to take advantage of. I already have my pilot's license that I earned two years ago here in the US. And then I was thinking, if I can fly a plane, then why can't I go to space? And why can't we make that accessible for deaf people? Why not? So that's what led me to joining Astro Access and did some research and experiments. And that really helped redirect my perspective that we can make space accessible. And, you know, it doesn't have, we don't need to have the right stuff we don't have to have the perfect bodies, if you will, because really no human is perfect anyway. So um, a lot of private businesses have commented about their goals 
that they want millions of people to go to space, to live in space and work there. So if one in four people have a disability, then who is sending us to space? Why not try to make space accessible now? So those are my thoughts, yeah. Shana, this is John, and I, I have a I have a thought that follows that. And what I learned from the Astro Access flight that we all took together was a question about how how much function is needed that is physical or visual or sensory to be able to be included in all aspects of flight, uh, and especially to Mars. Uh, is sight needed? Is is hearing needed? is the ability to use your hands or feet. I was born without arms or legs. Um, I, I, I found it to be like Dwayne, just liberating to be in a weightless state. But I think what I was gathering was trying to figure out what is the, what is the most inclusive way to gather in the, the missing 20 to 25% of the population of people with disabilities to be included in all future space travel. And if we do this right and do it in a universally designed way, we're not gonna leave anybody behind. And I think that's the biggest goal and the biggest challenge. Question before we move on, John, next time you go, would you like to leave your legs behind? I mean, we took them, but I, did you need them? No, I did not need them. I would gladly leave my legs behind, my artificial legs. Mm -hmm. Prosthetics. 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 Well, and uh, some of my patients pe do consider it to be their legs. They'll say, hey, hand me my leg, doc. And some of them think of it right. as a tool. Dwayne, how do you feel about your prosthetics? Are they your legs? Are they your tools? And, and is it important? So I am someone with three different heights. And that's became part of my experimentation in that zero G space. There's Dwayne at six foot with these beautiful running blades that are tall and bouncy for here on earth. And then there was a shorter version of Dwayne that stops basically where the, uh, where the leg stops. And uh, what that did was I was testing whether six foot Dwayne has greater than or equal to mobility in a zero G environment compared to 148 centimeter Dwayne. And what we found out was uh, Dwayne in a zero-g environment, who's shorter, has more nimble. He's more dexter. He's got more dexterity. Um, the end result of that kind of experiment, based around that space, was stop sending legs to space. You're wasting a whole bunch of payload material. Um, send amputees instead. You have a whole U.S. Army that already <laughs> is in a similar situation. You're ready to go. That's how you keep your uh, costs low, right? <laughs> but if I propose that and saying that only amputees in space, people would get angry at me. Um, but that's I, I would, not the I, objective. I would say we, we uh, widen that envelope a little bit. Let's just say people who weigh about half what a normal astronaut weighs. And exactly. I mean, I'm not, I'm not Shaquille O'Neal, but um, I also have legs. I don't want to exclude myself at this point. I'm very no, so. So here's the thing. What do you actually use your legs in space for? Just to anchor yourself. And on the flight, we found two points of harnessing of, uh, of, Two fixed point harnesses had much greater use than actually an anchor, which is quite simply a flight suit with an additional two points of harnessing. John tried the single point. He had a horrible time, uh, but that allowed us to test, testing and failing on how do you secure yourself in a space that makes it more inclusive for all. That's a flight suit improvement that came out of display focused assessment. And that's the value of uh, speaking, and I'll, I'll riff off Sheila's thing. There was the right stuff, right? It used to be my white right guy versus your white right guy to get yourself to the, to the moon. But if you want the commercialization of space and you want to include people of very specific knowledge, potentially farmers and other bits and pieces, they're not going to have that technical knowledge that you need in space. You need to make sure that you're including for people who are missing limbs and missing bits and pieces because you need that knowledge up there. And if you want that knowledge up there, what you have to do is you need to speak to the right stuff for right now, which is us, the disability community. We already live in a hostile environment that is inaccessible to us and we know how to make it so. You want to speak to people with lots of experience who understand their disability well enough so that when people acquire it in space, cause it's gonna happen, 
you're not going to just write them off. You're going to actually be able to utilize them for the entire length of the mission, making it stronger, longer, and everything else. Back to you. Thank you so much. And what you're getting at is not conflating configuration with competence. That's right. You know, I, I'm propelled myself in here with two legs, but the second Eric was in lunar gravity, he was much more competent than I was. <laughs> Honestly, he just extended himself to full height and he was off. The spinal cord injury patients who propel with a variety of tools on earth, they would never try to use their legs to navigate the space environment. It would not occur to them. They are off and they are gone and they are perfectly adapted. And what I'm really saying is everyone needs accommodation in space. Many of the people in Astro Access need less than the average person. Lucas. Why is accessibility in space important and why are we talking about it now? I don't want to be repetitive. I actually stand by to everything people said here, but especially I'm very aligned with Eric's thoughts in the beginning. So I'll skip this one and I'll dive in in more detail in a, in a future question. And so the next question, and, and this came from Eric, is how does accessibility and inclusion affect human space exploration as we go on to Earth? We've talked about that a little bit, but let's get into some of the particulars and details for this audience. Yeah, um, so I can take this one. I think there are some, some interesting things that we are already doing as part of the Astroaxis um, investigation that already f reflect uh, on Earth uh, for once. I think we are also as being Astroaxis ambassadors, we are having the chance to show to people that people with disabilities um, or whatever you want to call uh, our group, since we have a, uh, different ways of referring to ourselves. But um, I, I think we are, uh, we are showing we are capable of not only uh, finding the problems, but also bringing, bringing solutions. Uh, in the teams, we have we have a lot of te uh, technically talented people. We have medical professionals. We have pilots. We have um, all sorts of uh, different skills that we are showing that not only we can learn them, we can use them, and we can find solutions to problems. So as Eric said before, as long as we are part of the conversation, I think we, uh, we are doing a great job. And so, and talking to my case specifically, uh, one of the things I'm very interested in is I would like to help uh, other blind people to get in science, uh, engineering, mathematics, and this kind of thing. And of course, those are things, is the, the basis of developing a successful space program. If we're investigating how to apply those solutions, at the same time, we are also helping people acquire the skills in order to be able to be part of the, those programs. And I think that the effects of that uh, are already reflecting right here on Earth. So after my after being an ambassador, I think I have spoken to a few blind people that contacted me directly saying, hey, I didn't know it was possible to actually be like a, a soft engineer. I didn't know it was possible for me to, to go and learn sciences. And we have been speaking, we haven't been discussing this kind of thing. And yes, I, I would like to make um, space exploration a reality, but at the same time, I also think it's super important, like what, what are the benefits we're bringing to people living on earth right now? And I think, uh, although I can say my work is impacting millions of people, yet, but I'm pretty sure that is affecting uh, some people. And, and I think that they are like discovering new things that they can do. If, if I can interject here, and I'm going to go off script, even though I asked the question. Um, we have, over the decade, created an environment that dissuades people who don't fit into the ideal picture of the right stuff from entering the space industry. We're in a place now where there is a talent shortage across the industry for people capable of doing stuff. I know, I'm, I'm hiring right now, check out our website, and having uh, problems with it. And I, outside of the space uh, world, have a life in the wheelchair rugby community. Uh, John knows this well. And after the first Astro Access flight I did, which was September of 21, October of 21, um, I went to an event a few weeks later and I had dozens of people 
um, that I've known for years saying th that I thought had no interest in space suddenly like I've been interested in space and space exploration my entire life but I didn't think this was an industry I could even be involved with. Not as an astronaut, not as someone going through all this flight training and all of that stuff, just being in the industry at all. Um, if you don't have someone you can look at that looks like yourself in those situations, you don't see yourself there. And um, I am one of the few people in the wheelchair rugby community, I think worldwide, that works in the space industry. Um, and so there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people out there who are sitting on the sidelines because they think this isn't for them. So even if we're not designing for them to go to space, um, even if those aren't the people that will be on the rockets, these are still the people that can help build the infrastructure and the designs and everything else we need to make this happen. So I know I'm speaking towards disability stuff specifically, but I know that exists for essentially every minority group and um, something we need to work towards. And I see, I see Dwayne getting very antsy. Oh man, uh, you're, you're, you're pulling all the hard strings, right? So, yeah. so with, with that, Eric, um, it works both ways. The space industry, I'm walking around on things that are made of carbon fiber and titanium, the things that make you go further and uh, lighter. That 100% comes from the space industry. Display, display improvement has come from the space industry and vice versa. And so in this area, it works so many different ways with regards to employing people, which is inclusive employment, but inclusive service delivery, inclusive infrastructure. And if you make those things inclusive at the start, the cost becomes much, much lower. And in this area, you want to really kind of hone in on the fact that, um, that yes, it is 100% a, a thing that even a guy in a wheelchair back in 1987 who saw his father – um, in in the in Houston, wanted to be when he had his own faults, when he had his own legs, uh, wanted to be in the space industry. And I am not someone that is like yourself or Sheila. I am someone who's going to be a space tourist. And from that type of viewpoint, you wanted to see me as market share. You want to really think about me as the reason you're going to able to go further and able to fund all your projects is because you've included me and I have money and I'm going to spend with you rather than coming at you later with my legal team because you did not make it accessible and inclusive because I will do that if you don't make it accessible and inclusive. That, that's not a warning. That's just a fact. In, in, general, um, in general, it's way cheaper to design it in than to retrofit. I would rather pay you than to than to pay a lawyer to get access to it, right? So let's let's save a few steps and get us involved now because it lowers the cost for everybody. And in Australia, there's a beautiful example of one person in a wheelchair suing the Queensland government over inaccessible trains, um, being the accessible bathroom when the train was not uh, accessible and the passageway was not wide enough for a wheelchair. One person in a wheelchair sued them. And the retrofit cost was $350 million. Now, the question is, how many of your space companies out there go bankrupt at $350 million? The flip side question is, how expensive is it to talk to a person with a disability? And the question, it, it really is upon when you, are, when you speak to us. If we, all we have to do is use the stick on you, then I guess we're going to use the stick on you. But it's actually super cheap at the design stage to change the design out, make it a bit wider, make it a big, it's a pencil drawing. Let's make that happen. Back to you. John, do you have a carrot to go with that stick? John's got carrots. Well, see, as, as a lawyer, I, I uh, can't really speak too harshly against defending the rights of people with disabilities, but they're, my friends, Eric and Duane are absolutely right. One, one is leaving out the talent that is already there and is growing and the other is the the customer base or the consumer base that should be included automatically and should be valued and appreciated in all ways so um i'm 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 in total agreement with eric by the way whose whose wheelchair rugby picture is on the wall of our lakeshore foundation uh, for being a superstar rugby player uh no matter how tall or short you are compared to shaquille o'neal but I'm just saying, I think that there's that we just cannot afford to leave out people with disabilities with all different kinds of functions 
and capabilities from this discussion and this, in, this equation. This is Sheila, if I could add a comment to that. Yeah, you're right. I fully support all of your comments and everything you've said. I'm not going to repeat any of your comments, but I do support them. And you're right. I think it's better to pay for access now in the design stage rather than later. And I lived between two countries, the U.S. and Italy. And I worked and lived in Italy for five years, but I was born and raised in the U.S. And in the U.S., we have good legal protections, like I mentioned, the ADA. And I can get access to work, to education, in a lot of situations, um, if I'm in the hospital, I have interpreters, I can get captioning. When I moved to Italy, I wanted to have those similar services and protections. But one thing I realized is that Italy doesn't really have those laws. And it's a common problem throughout Europe, not just Italy, but uh, a lot of your European countries have this similar problem regarding their legal protections for people with disabilities. So the U.S. really does have um, robust laws for accommodations. So, I mean, we need those accommodations for basic services. And if we don't get those services, we are able to sue. So really having those legal, legal protections, which kind of relates to the comments that you were saying about um, investing in the design process now, making sure that everyone has access, that we're included in that teamwork, but really it's those laws that we have that allow that to even happen and make sure that everyone is doing their responsibility under the law. So that's my perspective regarding policy, a policy perspective, but kind of a business perspective as well. We want to do we dive into like the, the more, um, strategic and technical ways that Astro Access is diving into the accessibility issue? Because I know we've talked a lot about like the policy of it, the politics of it, and things like that, but um, we're coming up with real solutions and buying down a lot of the risk that exists for incorporating people with disabilities of various kinds in spaceflight. So um, I'll speak to, to one of the teams I led specifically for the most recent flight, which was, uh, we called it the seat docking drill. So um, one of the biggest risks um, perceived by suborbital launch companies that we've spoken with is the ability of someone with a disability, either physical or visual impairment, to uh, enter and exit their seat in a timely manner that is safe upon the gravity returning when it re-enters. Um, and this is not a risk we necessarily agreed with, but one that we knew we had to, to buy down. So um, in the most recent flight we did out of Houston in December, we designed two, uh, actually three analogous seats. One was in a Blue Origin New Shepard configuration that was reclined and whatnot. And then we had two that were um, very similar to the Virgin Orbit style um, seats. And uh, we had myself, um, Jose, and... Um, Oh my gosh, uh, what's your name? Sh yes, Dr. Mickey, Sherry was a one Mickey of them and as well, right? Okay, yeah, all right, so there's four of us. I lied. Um, and so in about 15 microgravity parabolas, we worked on entering and exiting these seats. They had five-point harnesses. We had to do it within a 20 to 25-second uh, window because of the, uh, the time of the parabolas. And I think we had almost uh, a complete success rate with that. I don't know the quantitatives of it, but I know that um, you know, we're measuring like if you were able to get at least two of the straps of the harness done by the time gravity returned, it was successful. So um, we're doing practical research and coming up with uh, real world solutions for these problems and not just um, addressing things in like a, a colloquial, like, wouldn't it be good if we did this sort of thing? And so I uh, just wanted to add my, my two cents there. Yeah, I mean, medically speaking, my colleagues have a lot of questions. You know, you're flying these these populations of people who have never been flown before. How do you do it? And I said, well, it's similar to as an FAA examiner, someone wants to fly a plane. They show up and they have a bunch of paperwork and they they put their medical records on my desk. And I look at the pile of medical records and I sigh. <sighs> okay. And I review them and they meet the criteria and they go fly their aircraft, either their private plane or the commercial plane, whatever they're asking for, right? Same thing, they want to get on a rocket, you know? A lot of people who can afford a quarter million dollar ticket show up with their pile of medical records 
and you sigh, and you review it, and you see if you think that would be a safe thing to do or you could make it a safe thing to do, right? Whereas many of our ambassadors show up with their prosthetic, their single prosthetic, and their record of being world famous rugby players, and you're like, where's your medical record? It's like, oh, I have a prosthetic. You're like, great, get on the plane. <laughs> you know, it's not hard, but someone has to go first. And so in many ways, Astro Access is doing what the commercial space flight industry did for space. They're going first. Not because it was ever hard or impossibly difficult, but because somebody needed to do the proof of concept. All right. So what other questions do you have? Around the 10 minute mark, I'd love to maybe take questions from the audience, but we have a little time. Eric, is there something else you'd like to ask now before I we mean, do there's, that? There's a million questions, but... Um. <laughs> No, I mean, I just want to state that we don't want to create the same problems in the future that we've created in the past. So I have a sport pilot certificate. There is a very specific reason I don't have a private pilot certificate is because I'd have to go get a third class medical. And there is a 90% chance that if I go to a random uh, AME or medical examiner, they're going to say no just because they see a wheelchair. And if you have an FAA medical denied, you can't fly anymore. So... We want to avoid these same mistakes and perceptions as we move forward off planet. And so, um, you know, while we are doing the testing on the technical side and for solutions for the physical environment around us, we also need to societally understand the impacts of the decision making we have now. And so um, I'm just going to plant that seed for everyone and um, look forward to any questions. I'm going to water that seed for you, if that's possible. Um, in that space, yes, we've built things historically on things that have come before, right? So when they think of space industry, they think of the flight industry because that's the logical thing. It's up in the air. Um, but that industry is a thing that occurred, what, 1960s? What That type of uh, regulation came in that type of area. And so the issue with that is that you have an exclusionary process that has been ableistic for a very long time. When you're thinking about the space, you actually have a clean slate and you can actually look uh, for building human systems. And this is mainly human systems. Build your rockets wherever you need to build them because your legislation allows you to do that. When you think about human systems, you want to think about strong legislation. And uh, places like Australia is very useful for that because you're right now because you've built nothing yet. You build it to the hardest, most regulatory code that is the most inclusive code and you'll end up with not needing to have so many barriers for the individual. It is just generally a safe space. Um, us walking around on Earth, we don't need to be carded everywhere uh, big, like to show people our medicals because we exist on this planet. But if we were being you know, assessed to enter some another planet, that's what's occurring over here. When people are born in those other, other planets, which will occur eventually, um, they will have a different kind of uh, physiology, potentially, different bone density, which would, on Earth they'd be considered as people with disabilities. And so if you want to think about Mars as a different in space, you're going you're gonna to need to think about us now as you get there because you're going to end up with those type of situations. And that's what I'm going to hand back to you. Lucas, do you have anything you'd like to say before we go to questions? No, let's go to questions. Sheila, do you have anything to say before we go to questions? No, no, nothing. All right, John, any closing remarks, counselor? No, doctor, no, this is great. All right, I'd love to invite the audience to ask questions. If you don't have questions, we have things we'd like to say. The ambassadors have a lot they'd like to teach you and can tell you, things you probably never heard about before, but we'd also like to hear about what you'd like to hear about. So please, if there are any questions, let's take them now. We all have a soapbox we can get on in the meantime. Mine has robots. Mine's built for legs. Yes, I have a question. Okay, Patricia Berlow, People Consulting. Um, since uh, right now we have about 50 million senior citizens, uh, we may be disabled, we may not. And so uh, it's about a fifth of the entire population in the US. So speaking about a market perspective, 
what is the cost of not including them? I, I think we're going to find out that cost in the, the next few years. Um, but I mean, I think that's something we can, from a space flight part angle, start thinking about it now. I mean, um, William Shatner recently flew on Blue Origin. He is 90, I think. And so he's got to have some sort of disability um, just, just based on that. And so um, this is going to be an increasing market with increasing demands and concerns that put different pressures on the ecosystem, be it financial or otherwise. Um, I don't know if I have a specific answer for you, but I think um, a lot of these issues are going to be much more prevalent over the next few decades. I can, Patricia, that's a great question. Thank you for answering. I can speculate on the answer based on what's happened with the commercial airline industry, at least in the U.S. The commercial airline industry has opted to make flight exceedingly difficult for people who are not standard configuration and function. Part of the reason why our panel is virtual, in addition to people being distributed across the this planet is the fact that traveling as a person with anything other than total functional ability is an exceedingly difficult. Transiting the airport, entering the plane, you can't take your wheelchair with you on the plane. It has to be checked. Anyone out there who ever checks durable medical equipment, your CPAP machines, your walkers, your wheelchairs, you go a 50% chance of having that damaged or destroyed in the cargo hold in flight damaged or destroyed. So when you arrive at your destination, how do you get around safely? People have actually died because of wounds they got when they got to their destination. Their wheelchair had been destroyed or damaged. They had to use a loaner. It wasn't right for them. They developed a wound. They died. This is actually true. I say yep. this as a doctor with disabilities. But the airline industry has chosen not yet to adapt. Pay attention. There's laws coming, and we may ask you to call your, your representatives. But some of the new um, funding for the airline industry may require that they make themselves accessible to all, including, including people in the older population. You want to travel. They want you to travel, so they should make it possible for you to travel. And right now, they're losing probably on the order of a billion dollars a year by not having accessible enough travel. The, the aerospace industry will face the same challenge. So, make money. Universal accessibility for universal utilization. That's the take home. Thank you, Patricia. I think we have another question. Adding on. Oh, sorry. Good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see. As far as the, uh, some of the emphasis or, or growing emphasis on the uh, human machine interface from an engineering perspective, uh, has there been any uh, I guess initial projects or initiatives that uh, has come to mind as far as some of those types of uh, instrumentation or any kind of conceptual designs. So uh, I'll jump in first and then I'll throw it off to the, the virtual panelists, but uh, Victoria Modesta, who is one of the ambassadors from our first flight, uh, she is a bionic pop artist and she has a single leg below the knee amputee. She has actually been working on the design of prosthetics that uh, are not normal leg shaped and actually uh, essentially tools. So there's one that um, could be used to grab onto to things to act as a hold for stability and things like that. It's mechanically driven, uh, kind of moves around like a snake. Um, and you know, those are some of the designs we're looking at, how to um, leverage these disabilities to make us um, exceptionally more uh, useful and able in, in microgravity environments and similar. But uh, I'll throw it over to the uh, virtual panelists to see if they have specific yeah. inputs. I can I take this one. That. Oh yeah, go ahead first. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, so to answer that question, last November, I went to Tucson, Arizona and we did analog astronaut training and it was the first time in history that we had two, two deaf participants involved in that analog astronaut training, which was awesome. So we had a man there and he brought an AI. So a robot that was like a torso and head. It moved, it spoke, it had facial expressions, and we were able to directly interact with the AI human. <laughs> and it looked like... Um, Blade Runner is what it made me think of. So for some context. So of course I had interpreters there and the goal of the AI 
was that it would travel to space with humans and it would support missions. So we were talking with the developer, the man who built the AI robot. The AI is called Bina 48. And it can understand voices and can have conversations, but it did not understand American Sign Language. So we were talking about developing the computer to understand visual language processing so that if I was signed to it, then the robot would be able to understand what I was saying. And just one moment for the interpreter. Sheila is freezing for me. So if I was responding in ASL and it could understand me, it could understand my hand movements and my facial expressions, then I think that would be awesome to have in space because there would be no reliance on sound, but we would be able to see each other and communicate thoroughly. And I had already experienced wearing a space suit, a pressurized suit during that training. And myself and the other deaf participant were able to fully communicate when we were in the suits because we were using sign language. We had no communication barriers because a lot of others were not able to hear once they were in the suit, unless they had the radio, but the two of us were able to sign clearly and communicate in the space suits. So really thinking about that human and machine interfacing really having those AI, the robots, those machines to support function. And one idea is better, better communication while we're in space. Uh, this is John. I, I would just love to follow up on that. I, I, I know there's an awful lot of technology and research going on with regard to brainwave, uh, brainwaves being able to move prosthetic arms and hands and and mobility. And I think that that might be able to just jump to the ability to communicate um, by brainwave to, from one person to another. And I'm not so sure that we have to pass through a physical prosthesis to be able to communicate. Uh, and there might be a lot of other ways in which the disability community educates the space community about what is potentially possible and efficient in the way we go about this. The disability community has a lot to teach every community, but especially the aerospace community. So I hope we get to that. We are out of time for today. However, I want to thank you all for being here and for listening and for your wonderful questions and your excellent attention. Please look up Astro or Astro Access. Please reach out to the ambassadors if you have any further questions. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Extraordinary.